May God speak to us through his word and in our worship today. Amen. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. So we heard from our gospel reading. But what do you think when you hear these words? Those who heard them direct from Jesus were certainly divided. For some they were too difficult, taking the words so literally that they couldn't cope with the idea. But what of us? Let's see some of the background as these words come down to us. If you've been to church in the last few weeks, you'll have heard a lot about the bread of life. Jesus giving himself to us. Stories of miraculous feeding and so on. But this week, like the last few weeks, our gospel readings are taken from John, not Mark as most of these, this year's readings are. John's gospel is of course rather different. There's no depiction of the sharing of bread and wine at the Last Supper, as you may have heard if you've attended recently. Rather in John, there are two main passages that in effect with, uh, give us some of the theology of what we often call Holy Communion. This one and the passage in John 15, a passage about being part of the true vine. That passage is much about our being part of the community of faith and our living out that faith. Early Baptists took that passage and spoke of new members as being engrafted into Christ, becoming part of the vine. The word communion in the New Testament, koinonia, which means fellowship or being together, is of course closely related to our word community. The concept of communion is about how we're bound together, about what holds us together as an identifiable and cohesive community. In his words here, Jesus is pointing out something about how human communities bind themselves together. For Christians, communion, koinonia, is about relationship with God and with each other. One of the ways we strengthen that relationship and central to our faith is regularly sharing around this table and eating and drinking. In our reading from Ephesians, that short extract we heard today, we see something of a word play on the image of drunkenness. Paul writes, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. One paraphrase of the passage rendered it, If you are going to go getting yourself under the influence, make it sure it's the influence of the Spirit and not of the wine. And it's not surprising that Paul uses wine as his example rather than beer because the Middle East was a wine culture. This image of getting drunk and in some places like in Northern Ireland being full is a term for being drunk. I remember my brother who lives in Northern Ireland coming out of a restaurant when someone who was a little worse for wear tried to get into our taxi and my brother said to the driver is your man full but we're urged rather not to be full of beer or wine but of the holy spirit and in effect this works whether our understanding of the spirit's action is of strengthening and supporting us in our daily lives or the charismatic understanding of the more dramatic gifts of the Spirit. It brings to mind those exam questions. You remember those things that teenagers had to do before the pandemic. You used to get questions about compare and contrast. 
what marks being filled with the spirit rather than with wine. So we come again around the table. What does it mean to you being full, filled again with the life of God in Christ by the action of the Holy Spirit? The two elements in communion. Bread, as we've repeatedly seen over the last few weeks, is precious not only as a symbol, but as a picture of the whole of creation and of Jesus himself. And if we can only sense that holiness, we can understand how horrible it is to waste it, but rather to share it so that our brothers and sisters no longer have to go hungry. If our faith means anything, it means that we share that bread of life, both physically and metaphorically, as we live our lives alongside the one who calls us to the table, the Christ. We share in bread, but also in wine. Blood, that picture given of the wine, prohibited for Jews, hence the way they prepare kosher meat, a little bit like halal meat for Muslims. It's also the source of the misunderstanding, I would argue, of Je Jehovah's Witnesses in denying blood transfusions. The Acts of the Apostles' instructions when they decided new Gentile Christians didn't need to be rigorously followers of Jewish laws. One of the compromises was to abstain from blood. And I'm sure what it means is not to have meat killed in an inappropriate way. But what for us? Is this bread and wine symbolic, real? What does it mean when we take this bread and wine together? The Reformation was at least in part an argument about the understanding of communion. Whether it be a real transformation, purely symbolic, receiving the essence of the life of Christ as we receive bread and wine, or receiving it in the whole event of sharing in the service. I'm not going to give you a definitive answer. But the names of this service can sometimes be helpful. In the Orthodox churches, they often refer to the liturgy and meaning specifically the communion service. Liturgy, of course, in Greek means service in both senses that we use it, both the event that we take part in and the response we have as we serve in the world. Then we have the word mass from the Latin for dismissal, the service from which we are sent out. Then Eucharist, thanksgiving. It comes from the same word as the normal modern Greek, thank you, Echaristo. And then we have communion or Holy Communion, the time we most fully come together as God's people. An act that we do as a community of followers of Christ. We also speak of the Lord's Supper, a reflection of the Last Supper, but also of the many meals we read of Jesus sharing with his followers and others. He is the host as well as the feast. Breaking of bread. In effect, where we started, the dramatic representation and making real of all Jesus did for us as he suffered and died, yet is alive once more. Whatever our preferred name, this gift is offered to us. The life of the God of God in Christ as we share together. May we indeed eat his body and drink his blood, 
whatever the temporary limitations on how that sh sharing is enacted at the moment. But, and it's a big but, the whole point of sharing, as we will in a moment, is to make a difference to us, individually, as a community, as those who go out, a difference to how we relate together, a difference to the way we live our lives, a difference as we face the world that is still affected by the epidemic. How are we most effectively going to share the love and care of the one whose life we've taken in and whose spirit fills us? May we know that strength, that presence around this table and as we go back to our lives in God's world. Amen. <laughs>